for the next um, 45 minutes, um, I'm just going to sort of cover some issues when operating uh, mobile offshore drilling units, as I've rather flippantly called on the slide here from jack up to belly up. Um, and it sort of follows on from what I spoke about yesterday for those that were here and draws upon the experience of, of, of our company. Uh, both as a, a worldwide provider of marine warranty survey services and also uh, the other 50% of our business is a worldwide offshore energy loss adjusting. Okay, we'll go again. Oh, hang on. Okay. Right, so what I'll aim to cover is, is, is basically just establish the normal baseline. What's, what's normal? in operating a, uh, a mobile offshore drilling unit. Um, and in sort of looking at that, it's just really the sort of the bits and pieces that should be done as we focus on the, the rig move phase of an operation. Because that, in our experience, tends to be where the majority of issues come from. Once the um, asset is on location, cantilevers out, and it's either working over or drilling, then frankly, issues then become more of a drilling issue in the marine, um, the marine issue. And then I'll just cover um, three case studies of uh, jack-up drilling rig casualties when, when things basically weren't normal. Um, these are all three uh, reasonably recent um, cases that I've, I've personally worked on. And what I've tried to do up with the first two, and not with the third because it's not a public record, but is to try to anonymize um, the rigs, the operators, whoever. You could probably work out who, who I'll be talking about from some of the pictures and stuff, but um, in, 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 in sort of respect for the, uh, for the clients, then um, we'd obviously like to, uh, to, to not uh, publicly announce who, who we're talking about. So, what are the normal phases of a, of a module rig move? And this is very, very sort of broad brush but essentially, before a, a jack-up goes anywhere to do something, we're going to be looking for a location approval. And that is looking at things like the soils analysis. What is the, the, uh, the makeup of the soil and the seabed where the rig is going to be penetrating and jacking? Um, what is the shear strength of the soils? What is the anticipated leg penetrations? And therefore, how, what does that do for the preloading procedure? How does that drive the preloading of the rig? We're also at this stage interested in the environmental analysis of the location for the rig. What are the 10 or the 100 year weather return periods, the anticipated environmentals that the rig's gonna to have to uh, be able to sustain um, in, 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 that, uh, in that location as well? Has anyone been there before? Going back to the soils, are there any footprints already in the seabed which could affect the ability of a new rig on location to properly penetrate and jack? And then the engineering analysis around location approval is looking very much at those pre-load pre uh, procedures, pre-load condition, and the operations manual of the rig as well to make sure that, that tallies with what we as the marine warranty surveyor would be putting across as the recommended uh, pre-loading uh, method. We've got three methods really, depending upon high, medium, or normal caution, uh, and that relates to the soils, it relates to the environment and the location, but essentially it drives the air gap to be preload at. And that becomes very relevant for one of the examples I'll talk about shortly. Um, then we move, having got the, 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 the necessary approval for the intended location, we're now going to be looking at the towage approval for the, for the rig. And in that, it'll primarily be the method. Is it a wet tool or a dry transport? Is it an extended field move? Because that drives different factors in the moon warranty survey, scope of work, um, et cetera, et cetera. What's the weather on the route from where the rig currently is to where it needs to be? Um, we use a piece of software called Safe Trans that does Monte Carlo simulations, including mimicking captain's decision on 100 year weather return periods to understand the risk um, to the assets on either the wet tool or the dry tool. 
and, and dry tours themselves are not 100% risk free. You have to consider like bending moments and other such factors when the, the rig is on the deck of the HLV. That all ties into the routing that the, that the assets are going to take, the particulars of the rig itself, and also the tugs that are going to be used to tour the final uh, or you know, do the whole move um, to, to, the, to the location where the rig will be sited on location. And these last two, these are engineering reviews, desktop reviews. These will also include attendance to do the suitability surveys for the tugs and to make sure the rig is properly configured, properly battened down for the, uh, for the transportation and properly um, configured for sighting on location thereafter. And then when it comes to the sighting on location, um, this is all about the positioning, which is the job of the, of the client with their rig mover, and then the preloading, the monitoring of the preloading, and that's been done in accordance with um, the preceding uh, engineering approvals and the certificate of approval if one has been required by insurers. So in broad order terms, that's where it is. The scope will be covered um, by the uh, Joint Rig Committee generic scope of work, and that will specify when, as I say, certificates of approval are required. Uh, is that plain? So, a very quick animation here then. When I first joined Matt Dan, our group marine director at the time, uh, Doug DeVoy, who's been in the industry many, many years, was very quick to point out that do not treat a jack-up drilling rig as a vessel. It is a drilling rig that can go the water for brief periods of time to be moved short distances. It shouldn't be seen as a vessel that can go hundreds and hundreds of miles on a deep ocean voyage, albeit sometimes they do. So we're now turning the cantilever towards the, uh, the uh, wellhead platform here that's obviously interesting for some work over. Start to drop the legs down towards the seabed as you move in towards the platform. Sometimes you skid the legs on the seabed into the final position, it just acts as a bit of a break against the, uh, the elements, although it's not always best practice. And then we push for the initial penetrations, and these will be predicted from the location approval and source analysis. Preload the rig, take on board the ballast, whether you do one leg at a time or all three at a time. Achieve final penetrations, stop the preload, jack to your operational height, cantilever out, and start the work. All very straightforward, he says. So turning now to the first of the, uh, the three case studies that I'll be uh, we're talking about this afternoon. This one involves a, uh, a punch through of the starboard aft leg of a jack-up drilling rig offshore of Angola. For those that aren't aware, when I talk about a punch through, that is where the sheer strength of the soils in the seabed is insufficient to take the loading from the legs and spud cans of the rig in question, and you get uh, a runaway of the leg, i.e. rapid leg deployment, or frankly, it just falls over, either because the seabed's given way further, or the leg has just snapped off. So the rig in question here, um, built actually in, uh, in Batam. It was only four years old when it was lost, and um, it had only ever worked in the same field offshore of um, Angola. And, that, and I'll touch on why that's relevant shortly. The job the rig was destined to do involved some, um, some, some drilling um, that was brought about because of a change in the legislation offshore of uh, Angola, where the government wanted to stop offshore facilities flaring off gas from hydrocarbon exploitation. And they wanted the um, gas to be piped to shore to be processed in an LNG plant. However, between the, the, the point where the gas was being extracted from the seabed and the point where it needs to be processed, there is a huge trench that sits at the mouth of the Congo River. So, what was going to happen was there was going to be, so can I just go back one? Can I do all that? Oh yes I can. So what was going to happen was there was going to be pipeline to this point, pipeline from this point, and then to basically get around the issue of a 800 meter deep canyon in the seabed, two jack-up drilling rigs were going to 
direction we drill from the north and south pitting uh, platforms, meet in the middle, case it, and provide a pathway for the gas to connect two ends of the pipeline. It's actually a really innovative solution. The fact that they were directionally drilling for construction purposes and not the extraction of hydrocarbons also had a major implication for P&I coverage and rep removal costs um, uh, subsequent to the, to, to, to the incident as well. So, as I say, the rig had um, only ever worked in that field. It had been got there once by dry transport and every other move thereafter had been treated as an extended field move. And under the terms of the, of the uh, insurance policy for the asset, it didn't need a marine warranty surveyor or marine warranty review of any of the procedures for extended field moves. That meant that actually no one had ever looked at the ops manual of the rig in question other than um, you know, the first move, the first move out there four years prior. The rig arrived at uh, the location of the South Pigging platform in the afternoon of Sunday, June 30th. Um, the, um, it had come, I think, off the top of my head, it was about 600 miles from somewhere else in the field, sold by three tons, no dramas in coming off the previous location, no dramas on the, um, on, on the move. And at the South Pigging platform, the soil data that the um, that the uh, client was working from was about four to five years old from when they'd have piled the um, platform um, at, 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 at that time. So on arrival at the standby location, they pinned the rig. They pinned the rig by going just for initial penetrations, keeping the tugs attached. It's a fairly common practice. But at the starboard leg, they got a deeper than expected initial penetration. And this caused a little bit of concern. The rig mover called back to, um, to, 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 to his, his uh, technical centre and said, look, you know, we've, we've, we've got 10 metres deeper on one of the legs than we anticipated in pinning. Um, and the, the advice that came back was, well, just be careful tomorrow. So on the, on the following day, early uh, first light, we started moving the rig to its position uh, against the side pitting platform. They sort of sighted the, um, the rig um, by late, late afternoon, early evening. And at this point, they jacked to a two meter air gap. And the point about the ops manual never having been properly reviewed comes into play here because the ops manual for this rig, in all circumstances, said you should be jacking to a five meter air gap on initial penetrations and preloading at that height. So by only going to two meters for the initiation of the preload, this was the onboard team thinking, we're listening to what was said, we're being careful. The air gap was then increased 45 minutes later to, 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 to three meters. All the initial penetrations were good, so they started um, preloading. What is also um, of note, at this point here as well, is that in common with many, many jack-up drilling rigs, there's a point within the preload cycle where the jacking system becomes inhibited, i.e. the rig just becomes too heavy for the jacking motors to deal with you know, the, the, the leg weight of the rig and the, the, the preload ballast they've got on board. And that is at about 45% um, preload. At 20.30, when they were at about 60 to 70 percent preload, the starboard aft leg punched through, uh, and that was the, uh, the aftermath um, of, of that. And you can see quite clearly the starboard leg is already broken, the rig is listening to starboard. What actually happened was that they had um, uh, a, a shift of, of trim of about one degree to starboard, which everyone thought, oh, that's not right. They started dumping the preload to try and re-energize the jacking system. It went to three degrees and then punched through. The aft part of the, of the rig hit the south pinging platform. A wave washed into the accommodation block, um, taking some people off their feet, washing them into other compartments and such like. That then receded. They went to master stations and abandoned the rig. 
it remained upright overnight, but bearing in mind where this is at the mouth of the Congo River, it was in five to six knots of, of, of current and started drifting away. And during that, and as a, uh, a diagram will show shortly, um, not only was it moving physically, but it was also twisting. It started to break off the um, other bits of the leg. It increased the down flooding through vent trunkings and other um, orifices on the uh, on the deck level of the platform, and it was it was basically lost from that point. So that's the next morning, as you can see, further over to starboard, and then ultimately it uh, rolled over and sank. And what we're seeing here is the remains of where the starboard leg broke in the in, in, in the in the well. And then here is where the forward leg, the zinc forward leg broke off and punctured the, uh, the forward ballast tanks. So it's actually a slightly better picture there. Only one person lost their life. It was the night deck supervisor who, when they were uh, going to muster stations, was so terrified that he thought jumping into the, uh, the sea in pitch black darkness with five knots of current was a safer option than going to his muster stations and he didn't have a life jacket on so he went overboard and was never seen again and this is what i was talking about in terms of how the rig twisted in the current before it ultimately rolled over and sank down here to the south and it, it was only in about 32 to 38 meters of water so it eventually pinned itself in position with the tops of the legs and the drilling derrick, uh, which was a, a, a bit of a challenge for the, uh, the ultimate salvage contractor, although it did make the offload of the residual fuel oil and such like and other fluids they had on board a lot easier to start the salvage operation. There was also some damage caused by the, to the, uh, some of the, the, the catwalks and ladders on the side of painting platform um, as well, because the rig initially went over and hit that before bouncing back and snapping off the starboard leg. So what were the probable causes here? In hindsight, it was probably pure soil data. As I mentioned earlier, the soils in this instance were about four to five years old from when the South Pinion platform was originally piled. And as when I saw out in life at sea, someone said to me, if you want to know what the seabed's like, where you are in the world, just have a look at the land around you. you know, the, the west coast of Scotland is a really good example of that. Law is another good example. It gives you a sense of what it's like there. Of course, there's a big canyon down on that seabed there. So we're gonna get scouring, we're gonna get changeable seabed conditions. And in hindsight, was relying on older soil data, the wise choice um, at that particular point there as well. There was also the failure to appreciate the, the, the significance of the deeper penetration of the standby location. That was a clue that should have perhaps um, you know, made people think again or, or, or indeed exercise more caution than they, than they, than they ultimately did. The um, interesting thing with this as well was that the ops manual tell it driving the operators to preload at a five meter air gap albeit they, they actually stopped at three, meant that when they did have a runaway of the starboard leg or, or, or the punch was starting to happen, they couldn't catch it. They were so far out of the water that, that physics was always going to give them a, a, a nasty drop back to any form of, of, of sort of buoyancy of the hull, um, notwithstanding the fact they had so much preload on board as well. Uh, and what's interesting was that this was declared a CTL very, very quickly and the insurance claim actually paid out within nine days on this. Um, you know, you'd think that you know, the total loss of a rig, big numbers involved, I think it was about 160 million euros, that, that, you know, that would require a degree more time to sort out. Actually, underwriters are very keen to pay these very obvious ones very quickly because you know, some of the ones that are less obvious uh, take a bit more time, so it makes them look good. Simon, was there any point in that when it could have been aborted? Or was it always destined once? Once they had sighted on the location, once they had preloaded beyond 45%, they were probably unlikely to catch it. So that was that first, first case of it. Second one uh, deals with uh, heavy weather damage. 
This is a, uh, it's a slightly odd design. It's, it's a fairly ordinary, um, four-legged uh, jack-up in, in this instance. Um, certified to a maximum water depth of uh, 90 meters. Quite an old style hydraulic jacking system on this one, which basically meant it wasn't the rig crew who did the rig moves. The operator of this rig has a team that they fly uh, around the world to move the four or five of, of this type of rig that they've got. And also, uh, <coughs> what's interesting with this one is that through, you know, um, through life growth in terms of weight and other you know, additions to the drilling package, uh, and this did have some unique aspects of the drilling package, and I'll try and point out in some other pictures in a moment. In 2008, sponsons were added on the stern to try and improve the buoyancy of the, of, of, of the rig when it was in the afloat condition. The background was that the, the rig was under contract to, uh, to, to, to gas from left. Uh, and was basically drilling a well in the Kora Sea, which is in the uh, north of the Arctic Circle. Arrived in, uh, in, in June 2014 via dry transport, uh, and actually offloading quite close to its drilling location from that dry transport. And early June is about when the, uh, the seas around here open up for, uh, for drilling activity. The window closes late October, early November. And therefore, Murmansk was chosen as the winter stack location for the rig, which was 568 miles um, straight line from, uh, from location to, to the stack. So in anticipation of, of, of stacking for the winter, um, the assured actually exercised you know, a huge amount of, uh, of, of due caution, due diligence. They had three modern, capable Norwegian um, anchor handlers to um, to, to, to use as the towing vessels, and they also have running alongside a standby rescue vessel as well. So all very sensible precautions, all um, good stuff. The rig was originally planned to move in late October, but a combination of weather and also a stuck drill pipe meant that they were about 10 days late in getting off location. Uh, which pushed them to, to a move in, um, in early November. They were getting weather forecasting from Fubro and also um, Russian sources. And although they weren't required to have one, they had a marine warranty surveyor on board. But the marine warranty surveyor, um, so just jump forward. Yeah, was from a small one man band. He, he, he was a, a small sort of self employed uh, surveyor they used for many other rig moves. Um, the local pilot does warn of unpredictable weather at that time of year. And interestingly, the ops manual for the rig gave no specific weather limitations, but talked about a maximum pitching limit of 11 degrees. And when I show you some pictures shortly, you realize, you know, is that right? But that equated to a four meter significant wave height, which is probably slightly higher than, than we as a company would be comfortable with for, um, for any sort of extended uh, wet tool. And as I say, it's treated as an, being treated as an extended, uh, extended field move. And then the final point on, 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 on this last bullet here as well is that um, you know small organisations um, are, are, are very you know not saying they're not capable. They're small. They're perfectly formed. They do what they do. They have their clients. But at the larger the organisation, the more backup the man in the field has, whether that be from naval architects, soil specialists, weather specialists, or whatever. The final weather forecast that was received on board the rig prior to the move looked a bit spicy for, a, for a, a, an initial period on the first night, but you know, within the limits that the, that the ops manual sort of in, in, interpreted. And as you can see, on departure from the location, quite a, quite a nice Arctic evening. However, overnight that uh, predicted increase in the weather became much worse than anticipated. Um, there was significant damage sustained by the heli deck and the lifeboats, and a decision was taken at first light to get everyone off the rig. They had the, the rig move crew on there, well, the drilling crew weren't on there, but the, 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 the marine crew were to get them off and then head towards one of the pre planned uh, standby locations 
to show them the chocolate there. That was the weather on uh, Saturday morning, and already, as you can see, she's riding very low by the stern, and the sponsors are designed to add extra buoyancy, are probably, in effect, here, adding extra weight um, and not helping the, um, the, the free board of the, of the asset. When they got to the standby location, it was found not to be tenable. They, they, they couldn't hold the rig steady enough to get the legs down and pin it, so they went further south. Basically, ended up in the, the next 48 hours going around this island trying to find some lead from the, uh, from the, from the weather. They eventually uh, managed to pin and jack the rig over here on the Tuesday, um, having in, over the, the course of the weekend and the, and the Monday seriously contemplated the fact they might actually lose the rig. I think they only lost one tour line at one stage. Um, but the way the rig was rolling shipping water uh, and the damage it was taking gave a real cause for concern. Uh, personnel were returned to the rig at that stage at the time to release the bunker in Mans. And they stayed there for four days before they finished the tour of four days into, into Mans. And I actually had the joy of visiting Mans in the November of that year to meet them on arrival. A very interesting part of the world for very uninteresting reasons. Um, so, damage, oops, sorry. Damage sustained. Um, this is the heli deck. Traditionally, heli decks are flat. Um, as you can see here, the uh, it falls away on the sort of port, port forward corner. And what they did on the at the standby location was actually cut away elements of the uh, the heli deck to rig, jury rig these uh, the support arrangement to prevent the whole pancake from from breaking off and, and sliding into into the sea. This is why. Underneath, this was probably part of the towing bridle coming back up into the, uh, the structural support of the heli deck there. And you can see a member that should look pretty much like that has now got this sort of right angle bend in it. You can see what's got been done to the steel support structures here. That was the uh, helicopter fuel pumping system. And then what you've got here is where the uh, supports are anchored to the hull, you've got the toy bridle in the background, you can see cracking there, but it starts to separate from the hull. Lifeboats and davits, they lost one of the lifeboats, the significant damage to the, uh, the catwalks there. Not really clear, but what you've got here is um, separation of metal parts, cracking, and this is actually twisted and deformed, um, the, the lifeboat structure. And then this life for, for had significant GRP damage from where it had been smashed into its own, its own falls and did it. Um, life rafts, GRP damage there. Uh, this was just an indication of you know, some of the foreign end upper deck equipment that took the damage. This was quite interesting. This was the um, vent trunk right at the foreign end of the rip, uh, which was the, was the main vent trunking for the, uh, the ge generator room, the largest single space on board. And that was very, very close to being breached. And if that sort of um, in any way allowed water ingress, that would have been uh, unstoppable down flooding probably given the, the conditions they experienced. And that probably would have led, led to the loss of the rig. Um, they took some, some damage down aft as well, which as you saw from previous pictures was, um, was lying fairly low. And the unique point about this rig that required the sponsors was this Texas deck area here. And the reason that, that this rig had this Texas deck was to allow them to work the BOP through the drill floor when on location, as opposed to having to come up with different arrangements to gain the BOP um, up and down from the, uh, from, from the, the wellhead. So why did it happen? Well, I mean, we all know a weather forecast is a scientific guess based on you know, the, the best the best data available. Um, but it's the local it's, it's the actual conditions that matter, and local knowledge could have made a difference. There was the warning in the pilot, but of course, you know, it's very difficult to judge conditions at night, and things do change at sea. Um, but was the rig ops manual fit for purpose? You know, on a two hundred and thirty-two page ops manual. 
does six paragraphs about moving the rig when it's at its most vulnerable point in, in, in operations, arguably, is that, is that fit, for, fit for purpose? And did the fact that they sort of gone that extra mile, got the very high spec vessels, got the rescue vessel, had a, a marine warrant to sail, to sail on board, did that give them in any way a, a sort of false sense of security that they were sort of ticking all the right boxes in, in their mind, able to move, move this rig? And in fairness to the operators in this instance, when you, once you're in the weather, then your options become very, very limited very quickly with emoji. Uh, and I've got to say, having interviewed the team uh, when, we, when they sort of made, made safe landfall, they, they did quite a good job under the circumstances, although it was very hairy for them um, for a period of time there. So it's not to say that you know, they could have predicted some of those things that went wrong, but there was a couple of other clues there, the local pilot, the unpredictability of weather, and the fact that the guy in the field, the marine warranties, didn't have anyone else to fall back on to ask the question, to ask the advice, or to just get that further analysis a wider analysis of weather return periods or whatever for that particular part of the world. So as, as, as mariners in the room know, the Arctic is a particularly horrible and unpredictable part of the world to work in. The final um, case study I'll, I'll cover um, is this one, it's a wet tool. Um, and in, for those that have already recognized the pictures, this is the Russian rig, the Kolskaya. The Kolskaya sank uh, in the Sea of Okhotsk on uh, December the 18th, 2011. Uh, there were 67 people on board, um, all lost their lives. Uh, one of those who also lost his life was the Marine Warranty Surveyor. She was basically contracted to drill, and there's a, there's a little chart in the second, I think, yeah, um, in the camp, off the Kamchatka Peninsula. And a bit like the previous example, had to come out of the field um, over the winter months and was going to go into a Sakhalin Island. And um, in fact, in this instance, I think she was either concluded to join the campaign or go to Vietnam. A marine warranty surveyor was required, and they were asked to provide a, um, a certificate of approval for WEC to, to Sakhalin. Interesting enough, I'm not going to name who, who the company was. We were invited in the first instance to the marine warranty surveyor for this and declined to approve the WEC tool. Um, it was, it, was, it was too long, too hazardous in the wrong part of the world at the wrong time of year. But they still did it and did it quite late in the season as well. And sure enough, seven days later, sadly, the rig sang. That was her in, uh, in happier times. Um, fairly, fairly old, but, you know, been recently refitted and was, and was in, in, in reasonably, reasonably good order. The... Um, other issue with the move as well was that they only had two, uh, two tugs, two, one, one icebreaker and one tug to, uh, to, to conduct the move, which again was a, another factor in our decision-making process as a company around the, um, the viability of the, of the wet tool. So they were drilling over here, wintering over here, and were roughly lost about sort of halfway through. The approval they were given to conduct the wet tool was actually premised upon uh, a south about route from the drilling location to Sacklin Island, taking in close proximity of the Kuril Islands. The idea being that they were always going to be within 24 hours of a safe jacking location. So if the weather deteriorated, if they had problems, they could go, they were never more than 24 hours away from somewhere they could go, put the legs down, and if necessary, get the rig out of the water. And there was a lot of discussion about this. That was the basis upon which the, the, the job was accepted. It was the basis upon which the approval was, was given. However, when the Marine Warranty Surveyor turned up and spoke with the tool master on the lead tug, he said, you're crazy. There is absolutely zero shelter in the curls at that time of year. In fact, the prevailing weather conditions probably make that a more dangerous route because you're going to be on a lee shore throughout. So if we lose the tool, if we lose an engine, we're going to be set down onto, on, on, onto the shore. So the decision was, was taken to go for a quick dash, if you like, as, as quick as you can dash on these things, open ocean, straight from point A to uh, point B. But that was never reflected back at any stage in the certificate of approval or the approvals process for the wet tool of the rig. So as far as, as far as 
one part of the MWS organization was concerned back in head office. They were going up at what was perceived to be a safe route. A local decision had been taken to do something different. And that, re that, that connection was never, ever made. And as, as I say, the COA was signed based on the Coral's route, but even though all parties executing the, the move knew that that was not the route that they were going to be taking. And the other factor here as well is that in order to save money, the drilling uh, contractor was moving the rig fully manned, which again, shouldn't really have been done on that asset at that time of year in that location. All started well, December 16th, um, all, looking, all looking good. Um, they were by this stage, as you saw from the pin on the, 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 the map earlier, very well committed to the tool. So on the 17th, when the wind and swell started to pick up, the situation started to deteriorate very, very quickly over the course of the day. And we, uh, we were asked to do a, 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 a course incident review of this. And we, we there, therefore got to see a lot of the um, correspondence between the NWS and his head office and his support basically um, desperate to get an extra tug because the two assets that they had were insufficient to hold the rig against the weather. They couldn't even heave two um, by, by, by this stage. And then in, in looking at the reasons as to why, why, why this, this, this sand incident happened, and it actually sank, as I said, on the, on the 18th of December, uh, was overwhelmed by the, by the waves, down flooding, total loss of stability, rolled over. Uh, stayed afloat for a few days before sinking. Um, to a certain extent, there's, there's always a tension when you, you, you're sort of drilling in, in an Arctic location between maximizing the drilling time and then what your options are for a tool to get out of the drilling location to your safe harbor for the winter. And for those who remember what I talked about yesterday, the, um, the Kaluk, you know, the, the high profile shell case off of Alaska. Um, and then you know, the Gulf Sky and out of this one, uh, and then you need the previous example as well, all talk to the fact that the, the contractor's gonna want to drill for the maximum amount of, amount of time possible and leave it to what this is the last safe moment to, to, uh, to move the route. The planned options for the routes that were available um, you know, were, were, were basically Emperor's new clothes. This was a, a real case of we can approve on this basis without really checking that the basis of the approval held true. <coughs> there was safe jacking locations, there was sheltered spots. Um, had they gone the, the site about route, the curls. The, um, the marine spread was insufficient um, for the move. And you know, no one said no at any stage. It's a real conspiracy of optimism. Uh, no one said no. And as a postscript to this, the insurance claim was actually denied because the Russian Register of Shipping retrospectively removed class from the rig because she was being moved fully manned and that was not in accordance with, um, with their, um, their class certification. <clears throat> so it was you know, tragic in terms of the loss of life and obviously there was no insurance recovery of the value of the, of, of, of the rig. So I guess every presentation needs a summary. I think there's a difference between following procedures and understanding procedures. And this is where the experience of surveyors comes, comes into play. It isn't a tick box exercise. It's, it's using you know, experience, it's using um, you know, necessary support uh, uh, to provide the, the, the information and, and interpretation on the data to make sure that there's a real understanding of what the procedures are there to do what they're trying to help you achieve and what they're trying to help you um, avoid. With all three of the examples I've shown, there, there, there were clues where there that could have sort of flagged up um, where things might go wrong and, and they were missed. And it's call it the Swiss cheese model, call it the safety chain model, whichever the safety culture model you want to use. There were opportunities in all three examples to break the chain to say, hang on a second, this isn't quite right. And as I said at the, uh, earlier on, you know, these, are, these are assets that are designed to spend short periods of time in the water for short journeys, not long periods of time in the water being treated as, as, as vessels in their own right. They've got a low freeboard, they've, 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 they can flood very quickly, um, and therefore the reserve of buoyancy is very low, 
things can go wrong, very wrong, very quickly. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's. I thought it was one more bullet, but clearly not. Anyway, happy to take any questions. Yeah. Jason, Jason. use microphone, please. Simon, fascinating. Um, you mentioned about the tension between um, drilling time and um, <coughs> what's the, the tension between drilling, drilling time, time and, and, and moving. Moving, yeah. And there's all this commercial pressure yeah. uh, just to, to maximize the time to, to set, uh, move the brakes. Who, what can you illustrate? Can you explain more on the chain of command for this operation and who has the last say to say stop uh, if, if the weather is inclement or? or the, um, it's ultimate, ultimately, it's the, um, it's the operator's responsibility because they're the ones operating the rig, they're the ones who are going to move the rig, they're the ones who have got the insurance cover. What we tend to find, and we, we've done a lot of um, CMOS uh, rig moves um, um, and also some, some high North Arctic and Europe rig moves, what we tend, tend to find, Phil, is that, um, and this isn't me, plugging my company to the marine warranty survey, but generically speaking, the marine warranty surveyors tend to get brought on board, it's something that Alex Harrison said yesterday, they tend to get brought on board at the last minute. So it's all right, we need to move a rig out of the, the, the ice and stuff, where we actually need to move probably next week, which doesn't really give much time to do all the necessary uh, engineering and procedural reviews. And nor does it give any flex where if we want to run the weather simulations and say, well, you can't wait till next week, you know, the, 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 it's just not gonna work. So, you know, the way around that is for the drilling contractors to sort of get in the mind that they need to you know, collaborate more with their chosen marine warranty survey provider, because that is a, a, a partnership then in, a, in making a, a, an event like this a successful event, rather than leave it to the last minute, having it as a you know, complete sort of imposition on them by insurers, and it's all just a bit too late to change things by then. I mean, the, the Kolskaya one could have been been, um, she could have stayed there for a little bit longer um, on the location, although some ice was starting to form. She could have stayed a little bit longer and it could have got a dry transport there in hindsight. 